You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. I have the pleasure, um, you know, long, long story short, I got to meet Alex. You guys remember him from our last episode uh, at the Richmond Fishing Expo. And we got to talking and brainstorming. I'm going to say like, this was completely your idea to actually get this together. I'm gonna give you full credit um, (laughs) to get me down here and actually to do a deep dive on on one particular topic that we're going to get into, which is the Alabama bass issue in Virginia. And then also just a little bit of background on, you know, on this guy right here, who you said, I have got to talk to. So Michael Bonarski, um, thank you so much for meeting us. And really, like we were already talking about this before we started recording, what got you into this? I know you were, uh, you want to become a bass master and then now you're here. Well, that's what's crazy. My, my background's a, a little unique for somebody in this field. So when I was a teenager, I wanted to be a professional bass fisherman. When I started to get into college, I wanted to be a professional bass fisherman. Um, I was fishing every chance I could. Any day I could get out there, um, I would get out there fishing 100, 150 days a year, fishing tournaments every weekend. And when I was in college, I got some really useful guidance about, you know, career opportunities that were present. I always like to joke that I I was good at math. um, So I got some really good advice to get into this field in that direction. And that's what I did. And I realized that there's a lot of things you can accomplish if you've got the background and the understanding as an angler. So I've gone from being the person at the meetings complaining about the regulations to being the person that is now presenting regulations to the board and trying to make sure that what we do really represents the interests of the anglers, looking at it from that perspective. And I actually think it's given me a unique perspective. That being said, I still watch the Bassmaster Classic and I'm very excited to see who's going to come in with 28 pounds of fish and completely upset the uh, top five standings in the final day. I still get a big thrill out of watching so was that. This, was this a college advisor that pushed you in that direction? Was it was it a family member? This was in college. So a- as I was going through there, I got some really great mentorship early on in my college career, being able to get into fisheries management without the proper prerequisites. Um, and when I started doing fish management, it all kind of gelled. So watching the intersection between the environment, the people, and then the regulatory framework really made a lot of sense. And it was kind of an epiphany. And at that point, I I tried to make sure that the coursework that I went to, the coursework that I enrolled in um, was more relevant to pursuing a career here. And actually, um, prior to coming down here, I worked extensively as a scientist. So my background's actually more quantitative analysis, running numbers. So that was what your so you got a a a major and a minor then and it was minor. So I have a P, I have a PhD in fisheries management from the University of Georgia, and my background there was working with what you call population dynamics, understanding the processes that drive fish reproduction, fish survival, and ultimately fish abundance, um, and then kind of parlaying that into working with species as varied as sturgeon, black sea bass, summer flounder, bluefish, weak fish, uh, scup, tatog. Um, One of my favorite studies, actually, is we were able to do work looking at rod and reel sampling for Tatog in Massachusetts, recognizing that the surveys that we had in place didn't adequately capture Tatog, which are structure-oriented fish, because the surveys were off a structure. So looking at angling is actually a really great tool. And that's only something that kind of kicks around in my mind is how that angling perspective can really inform not only the policy recommendations, but also the science. I think there's a direct linkage for anglers to get involved with the science and contribute to citizen scientists. How does that help you having that bass background, like you said, going into that specifically about TOG and understanding that, you know, they're more structure oriented. Like, how does that help you view things that different people? So if you're looking at a portrait, do you view it a little bit differently because of your tournament background? I think I do. It's, It's very difficult to disentangle being an angler from everything that I do. So it's not a bad, it's not it, a bad thing. <laughs> it, it, it's challenging because a lot of the stuff is very personal in terms of, you know, the stuff I lose a lot of sleep over some of the resource issues that we have. I genuinely get concerned about how we're going to be able to do the right thing or the correct thing, given the different perspectives and things that are out there on the table. I mean, I lost a lot of sleep over Alabama bass, which is one of the things that, you know, I know we're going to talk to extensively. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, there was a time I fished for them in their native range when I lived in Georgia. Um, I I look at it from the perspective of though they could be entertaining to catch, we're also jeopardizing the largemouth bass resource. So to me, that's a personal thing because I still spend my weekends out there bass fishing. I get recognized. I go to Lake Chesden all the time. 
um, I get recognized. I'm, I'm not going to tell anybody what color my boat is, but um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I get seen out there. So this is always factoring into how I look at everything. So it provides a bit of a drive to try to find these solutions and try to look at it. It, it also provides an awful lot of understanding about the user base um, and is a big reason why I do things. I spend a lot of time on fishing forums. I spend a lot of time reading some of the fishing magazines that are out there. I think I've got a copy of In Fisherman and Bass Times on my desk right now. You usually and, cycle to my desk after. I, yeah, I, I usually put them <laughs> on Alex's desk. And, and while those magazines are not as useful from understanding the nuances of catch curve residual analysis to look at environmental impacts of flow on fish reproduction, they're extraordinarily useful in determining what anglers are thinking about things. You know, getting back to the people are a big part of managing a fishery resource, and it's critically important to understand that. On the other hand, it also means I end up with whatever new spinning reel one of the companies has come out with, thinking that's a great idea as I see the advertisement, and then putting it to go along with the other 18 spinning reels that are in the boat. So it's 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 a bit of a, a different perspective. It's something that, though I will say, really drives me and really kind of gives me a personal connection and kind of a personal objective with a lot of the stuff that we try to do, because I'm ultimately looking at how we can maximize recreational opportunity and maintain sustainable fisheries. How has your views changed when you were winning state tournaments as a youngster and, and, and thinking about what DWR does and now you're here? Uh, like, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, Thomas, the, the biggest transition has been understanding just how complex the situations we face are. You know, it, it's human nature to look at things and think that there's only a couple of things going on. And a lot of times as an angler, I was very focused on very specific issues, whether it was the availability of vegetation, whether it was the nuances and appropriateness of fishing for spawning bass. And the truth of the matter is there's 18 or 20 different things that influence fisheries management. And a lot of times we're faced with what I consider bad and worse options. There's a lot of circumstances where there is no clear path. And trying to do the right thing, you know, a great example of that would be um, dealing with some of the circumstances beyond our control. We know that flow availability, i.e. from rainfall, is critically important in establishing good year classes of smallmouth bass on rivers like the James. There's very little we can do about that. Mm -hmm. And trying to manage around that, look into different management actions, you know, whether it's size or bag limits, whether it's trying to get hatcheries online to stock additional smallmouth bass, or whether it's dealing with threats such as Alabama bass that are going to further add stresses. It's not as simple as, you know, just put a size limit in place. It's not as simple as stock more smallmouth bass. There are a dozen different things that impact this. And, and I think you touched on this too. It's the human nature thing of you want to blame one thing. Um, and so, you know, on the upper Potomac, it's like, well, clearly it's the flathead's fault why we have no smallmouth. And you talked about it. It's not that we've had a couple of years of we've had poor spawning classes. It's not the water quality. It's like, it's always a death by a thousand cuts. And we always want to blame just one thing. And it's hard. And I can stick to what you, you need to do um, when you get the message out there. It's like, enlightening the public of like this is the situation on the ground and to, and to kill the doc talk because the doc talk is is fascinating how that can just grow out of control yeah we, we're trying to bridge the gap between kind of what's going on behind the scenes the science and management of those resources to the public with a bit of a fishing spin on it um and the smallmouth the smallmouth thing is definitely a, a concern for us and alabama bass are sort of an, an added stressor to that you know multitude of 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 negative impacts that that are occurring and having a sort of an aggregated impact on the fishery but high you know high flows in the springtime like mike was saying you maybe easier to deal with one or two bad years but when you have four or five high water years in the middle of may compounded on top of each other then you have four or five basically year classes that are missing and then all of a sudden where are all the fish is kind of the deal there so but um but yeah, it's it's just a, a, a abundance of, of issues kind of compounding on top of each other. Um, so one of the big things for us is just preventing the spread of, the, of a species that might have a real impact from a genetic standpoint with smallmouth bass. Yeah, let's set the table about that because I heard the rumors. I've heard the rumors. I've seen it on social media a little bit. And then we got to talking about the spotted bass, the Alabama bass situation. And then I did a deeper dive and then, you know, getting into our main topic of, of today. When set the table of the background of this issue, when did it, when did you guys see it on the horizon? Where are we today from like point of origin? 
and then like what can be done yeah so um what year was the fish did the fish first show up at clater mike was that the, fir the first time we confirmed alabama bass would have been 2017, 2017 with the state record spotted bass that was submitted um, looking back into it, it's very clear that Alabama bass have been in Virginia since about 2008, 2009. Um, looking back into it, we just hadn't been doing the genetic testing. Um, it's also important to recognize that Alabama bass weren't separated because you had said spotted bass at one point. And, I bring and, the, too, and the general yeah. public, a lot of it is going to look at these fish as spotted bass. Um, the experts that study fish genetics, which I am not one of them, I'm, I'm more of a nuts and bolts fisheries guy. Genetics was never my strong suit. So I got to rely on the experts on this one. Um, they, they split Alabama bass from spotted bass, um, about 15 years ago. And at that time, a lot of these fish had been moved around as spotted bass. We actually got very lucky because we used to move spotted bass through Virginia and thankfully they were spotted bass, not yeah. Alabama bass. Back in the seventies. Back in the seventies. Um, cause spotted bass are actually native to the Western part of the state. Alabama's are not. Yeah. But the, the Alabamas kind of came on the scene in the late 2000s, um, places like Diasin Reservoir and Clater Lake. And the large, um, quote unquote, spotted bass are actually Alabama bass. Um, and we first detected them with the uh, submission of a fish for a state record spotted bass that there were suspicions amongst us that it was a largemouth hybrid. And when it came back as an Alabama, it kind of uh -oh. it kind of shook us. And we were really concerned about how we managed that and looked into some of the case studies and realized that this is probably the biggest threat that we have. Why? Well, the, the big threat that comes with an Alabama bass is you've got a real unique critter here. You've got something that can outcompete a largemouth bass. There are very few fish that can outcompete a largemouth bass. So when you see the introduction of an Alabama bass, you're very likely to lose your population of largemouth or see it get down to a level um, that's only a fraction of what it was. On Lake Norman, for example, it's about a 10th of what it was prior to the introduction of Alabama's. The other big one that comes up with Alabama's, particularly given the smallmouth bass, you know, we were talking earlier about the smallmouth bass rivers in Virginia, you know, how it's this really great resource that we have, which it is. Um, Alabama bass interbreed readily with just about anything but a largemouth. So when you get an Alabama bass introduced into a system with something like smallmouth bass or shoal bass or red eye bass, as our friends in Georgia are dealing with right now, they swamp them. So they interbreed with the fish. You lose your pure strain smallmouth bass. And we've seen situations in some of the reservoirs in northern Georgia, places like Lake Chatoug, where they have lost their entire smallmouth bass population because of this they call hybrid introgression. And, play, and playing out in that example relatively quickly within like 10 years. Yeah, this is not, a, this is not something that happens um, over the span of 30 or 40 years. These declines are noted rather quickly. I'm glad you brought that up about Georgia because I know the Shoaly bass is something that they, they really adore down there. Like how much of an issue is it there just to like take that window here and maybe see in the future what's going to happen here? So I, I, I had mentioned earlier, I lose a lot of sleep about some of these issues. I don't think I would sleep at all if I lived in Georgia. That bad. Because what you've got in Georgia is so- Black here, bass capital. <laughs> well, yeah, the black bass capital of the world. Here in Virginia, we're fortunate to have largemouth smallmouth and then spotted bass, all native to the western part of the state. And we've got great fisheries for largemouth and smallmouth throughout the rest of the state. In Georgia, you've got this tremendous diversity of bass that are in basically just about every river system. When I lived down there, I used to love fishing for red-eye bass in the Oconee River. Um, you'd fish for them in what looked like brook trout water. It was very oh, interesting. Really? I, so I cool. grew up trout fishing um, in yeah, small streams that. and catching small bass out of the riffles and rapids was just amazing to me. But they've got that situation with things like the warrior bass, Tallapoosa bass, red eye bass, Bartram's bass. <laughs> I, mean, I think they've got like 14 or 15. And, you know, recently talking with those folks, the only two bass species in Virginia that are, or I'm sorry, in Georgia that aren't threatened right now are basically your swanee bass, which live in environments that aren't really hospitable to Alabama bass, mm -hmm. and your largemouth, which even though your largemouth decline, they don't ever get what they call extirpated or knocked out. But there's a lot of issues finding pure red-eye bass, pure shoal bass in Georgia. 
And they've lost a lot of their tremendous um, natural history, natural diversity that they have because of the spread of Alabama's. And this is why context, I know we were talking about, and you guys know how much I hate TikTok, <laughs> like in short form content, the context. And that's so important is like, this is not just something that you're seeing here. You lived it in Georgia and now you're here. And now you're like, I've seen, and I know what that's like when this happens to an ecosystem and you don't want it to happen here. And I think that's, that's also really important that, yeah, you, you've seen this happen already before. Yeah. And, and unfortunately we're seeing some of the integration already in some of our bodies of water. So if you're, if you're a small mouth advocate, the Alabama bass situation is straight sobering. So basically with some of the genetic results that we've, we've done. So we Mike, you can give us a background, but we ran basically a black bass genetic baseline mm -hmm. after we had confirmation of that original fish that was submitted for state record status on Claytor Lake. We wanted to get just a baseline. What are our genetics like all across the state on our black bass fisheries? And so we, we did an extensive amount of um, fin clip analysis where basically you take a thumbnail sized portion of the pelvic fin. We were working, I think, with Auburn at the time um, and uh, running genetics. And basically what we ended up finding out is that we had Alabama bass and more water bodies than we had originally anticipated. And in some of these water bodies like Claytor Lake, where we get the results back and we're seeing alleles from Alabama bass, spotted bass, um, and largemouth bass. And you're looking at the, uh, basically a fish that's a mutt bass. And it's just a, you know, a, uh, it's got, it's got genetics from a variety of different species, uh, which is not desirable from a management perspective, but that's what we're kind of dealing with right now. And some of these, um, another water body that we've seen some of the hybridization with smallmouth right now is Philpot Lake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, we've seen a lot of hybrids in Philpot. Where's Philpot? Yeah. So that's actually down uh, just upriver from Bassett, Virginia, down in what we call Region 2. But um, it's an impoundment on the Smith River. Um, and uh, we've got some fish there where if you looked at basically from the lateral line up through the dorsal part of the fish, it looks just like a smallmouth bass the lateral bars, um, the markings, the modeling, and then basically from the lateral line down through the ventral side of the lower side of the fish looks straight like an Alabama bass where you're looking at the fish and it's probably a first generation hybrid or close to. Um, but that's, that's the kind of stuff that's really concerning because they'll continue to back cross to the point where the smallmouth genes just disappear. Um, and we're in a scenario now where they've been introduced into situations like the like diacin reservoir where they've spilled over gotten down into the probably from spillover down into the tidal portions of diacin creek and into the tidal chickahominy river and unfortunately we've had genetic confirmation of pure alabama bass uh, in the fall line section of the james river in downtown richmond which is a real concern for um for our smallmouth population um so kind of a variety of different water bodies were showing showing you know positive Alabama bass. Um, when we did that baseline, I think we we found them below um, below Claytor Lake in the New River. Um, uh, we've gotten them, like I mentioned, in Phil Pot, um, the Tidal James Diacin Reservoir. Um, there's a there's a, a variety of different water bodies that they've popped up in, unfortunately. And I want to keep hitting this because I even had an issue when we first started where I wanted to catch myself on Alabama versus spot. And that's it's important that the spot is native to Virginia, correct? It is in the western part. In of the, the western part. Yes. But the, the Alabama is not. But then they look alike. And so if somebody catches one, that's something that's important that there is no way without genetic testing you can tell the difference. Oh, they're, they're physically identical. We, we actually have the regulations in place on Alabama and spotted bass are the same. There's no size or bag limit in Virginia. If somebody catches a fish that's suspect, um, ideally they'll have a fin clip, but we want them to submit a picture. Um, from our perspective, anything that we see in one of the larger reservoirs, we're going to presume is in Alabama until proven otherwise. Um, we do have a legacy of spotted bass in a lot of our different rivers across the state, so they do show up. But from our perspective, we'd rather have a false alarm and look into it and we've seen an awful lot of misidentified largemouth as well. I was going to say. Know, lar largemouth are funny because they've got such variable color patterns mm -hmm. on them. Um, you know, one of the, when we talk about the traits for Alabamas, you know, Alabamas definitely have a different sheen to them than yeah. largemouth do. But it's a really bad criteria when you say they're just a little more greenish gold than greenish silver <laughs> relative to the two of them. So we try to look at things that are 
readily identifiable like the mouth or the broken spot pattern um, or the teeth on the tongue, but you can catch largemouth that have teeth on the tongue. You can catch largemouth with a broken spot pattern. Um, and if you spend enough time around them, we can usually tell pretty quickly, but we've had fish that have typed out as largemouth that we've been a bit concerned about and we're glad to get the samples in. It's just like how, because I remember when when the snake had terror really started and then people started to kill bowfin because they thought like, well, this is the snakehead. And Odenkirk told me the stories of that when I had him on the show about he gets phone calls and like, that is not a snakehead. Don't kill it. I can't believe that when you look at the spot Alabama, that's got to be even worse because of how close they look. Because if you're misidentifying a snakehead and a bowfin, oh my God, that's got to be a pain on your end for how many f calls and how much you're in inundated <laughs> it, it, with that stuff. You, you know what though? I To me, so as as the one who um, I worked with our administrative assistant to handle the initial um, reports of Alabama bass, and we got about um, from the general right. public. So it was a manageable number. But the thing that really spoke to me was how concerned our anglers were about it. Mm -hmm. I was actually really encouraged to see, even though there was a lot of false positives, I was really encouraged to see that people took it seriously enough because when we get information out to the general public, we're always, we're always doing our best to get some attention to it. And I was really impressed with the conservation ethic of Virginia's anglers coming up with fish that were potentially suspect, sending them to us so we could follow up. And through that work, we'd actually found fish um, in new bodies of water. You know, They've started to show up in car reservoir. Mm -hmm. And those car reservoir reports were actually reported to us by anglers prior <laughs> to the time we found them doing some biological sampling. Yeah, and you're kind of hinting at really the partnerships that we've built throughout this with our education campaign on this. Obviously coming out with new regulations, um, illegal to have live possession of Alabama bass outside of the body water of catch. But then we really pushed into an, uh, an education campaign. And it's a great example of how our agency has partnered with um, basically the bass fishing community and bass fishing organizations like the Bass Angler Sportsman Society, the Bass Federation, uh, the Bass Fishing Hall of Fame. Um, we actually all went in on a grant together to, to develop educational materials to kind of get this, get this campaign out there. So we extensively... Um, uh, handed out pamphlets and fin, fin clip envelopes to TBF and BASS tournaments all across the state. Um, and we're trying to get the word out for folks to kind of look for suspect spotted bass or Alabama bass and new bodies of water. Um, so trying to have the bass fishing community be additional eyes in the mm -hmm. field on top of our sampling, which has proven um, to be successful in identifying um, some new populations and other, other water bodies. And, and I'm overly optimistic. I'm overall fairly optimistic with the response we've gotten from the bass fishing community. You know, I'm reminded of the catch and release movement that was really pioneered by the bass fishermen who mm -hmm. were really concerned oh, yeah. about the sustainability of the resource. And to me, this fits in as a conservation value, i.e. don't move fish. And it's been really wonderful to see that level of enthusiasm. It reminds me of the catch and release movement. And they've been fantastic partners. You know, to build on that further, um, you know, the thing that really pulled all of this together and actually helped to set a lot of our internal discussions was a meeting at the uh, the BASS Conservation Summit. Really? In Birmingham, Alabama, the classic that they had down there. Um, because what, they had what brought- What that? Oh, I'm trying to, this was right at the beginning. I remember, dri I remember driving back and hearing on the radio about this new virus that okay, was spreading. Yeah. I, I, I distinctly remember yeah. being a bit concerned that I spent that much time in a convention center. Um, <laughs> as this was unfolding and, and yeah. then getting the reports of a bad flu that was circulating. <laughs> I remember that distinctly, but you know, at that meeting, um, they had brought on the conservation director for the North Carolina bass nation, bass nation, um, by a guy by the name of Bill Frazier, who had brought in and worked with some of the biologists in North Carolina. And I remember challenging the folks there of saying, if they were willing to provide some backing on this, that this is a giant threat. And if they're willing to work together with us, I think we can make a lot happen. And I've been delighted by the enthusiasm that's come through, having been at a lot of bass club meetings and seeing things like usage of nets being very contentious. I was very delighted to see that that strong conservation ethic come through and the solid support to the point where, as Alex was saying, we were distributing envelopes, posters. Um, we had a um, Bassmaster Open out here on the James and anglers were excited to bring in potential Alabama bass to be killed for further analysis. I never thought I'd see that day yeah. where a tournament bass fisherman would be excited about potentially killing a bass, but they're so concerned about 
the long-term sustainability of the bass populations we have with largemouth and smallmouth that I, I think they truly believe um, in doing the right thing for those resources. How much communication do you guys have when the bass with bass? Like you talked about the summit and the bass opens to come to the James River for the last 300 years, it feels like they've been <laughs> going there. Like, do you guys have a lot of communication or do they have to reach out to you if they want to hold a tournament? Like, how does all that work? So the tournaments are not permitted in Virginia. Access sites are permitted. So it's one of those things. We we try to minimize regulations and regulatory burden on it. So that's that's kind of independent of it. It's more of leveraging the joint interests and joint partnerships. So we are always in close contact with the conservation directors from the big fishing organizations in Virginia, like, like TBF or BASS, as well as the national level of those organizations with support. So we're always back and forth. And um, our biologists stay actively involved within these communities and within these groups to help get the message out, rely on them for some supplemental sampling that can come out. And we've really been trying to build on the utility of that with helping our science. You know, another great example when we're talking about black bass has been some of the sampling that we've gotten with our F1 bass stocking study from the bass fishing community that, you know, tournament bass fishermen are, are just a little bit more effective at catching large bass than our <laughs> electro fishing equipment is. We'll, we'll give that shout out directly to it. I, okay. Y you brought that up and I just saw Halliker's uh, Instagram shout out, dude, you do really good work up where we're at. And he had this, he had this little podunk fish finder when he was dropping trees and it really, it, in my mind, it really thought about forward facing sonar and the advances in that. Is that a tool ever that you guys could use for data collection as the technology progresses? So it's it's interesting. I know to look. it's off the wall, but I was like, this no, it's, is it's, good. it's well, it's not off the wall because I I remember when I'm starting to date myself because I remember <laughs> I I remember getting excited when I had a uh, I first got a color graph on the front of my boat and that was a big deal mm -hmm. and having enough resolution to watch my silver buddy I remember that, but when side scan sonar came out, it was actually adopted by a lot of the scientific community for data collection. Really? Well, side scan sonar is extremely useful at delineating habitat quickly. Mm, and okay. being able to process the data, you get an awful lot of resolution. You know, if you're skilled with side scan sonar and can tell. So when I used to fish in New England a lot for winter smallmouth, a lot of what I would look for would be the break line between gravel and the mud in the bottom of those natural lakes because the smallmouth in the winter would hold towards the end of those points in 39 degree water. And if you found that edge, mm. you could work around it with a silver buddy, hair jigger, a drop shot. That type of resolution is extraordinarily useful if you're looking to rapidly go through habitat delineations, if you're looking to quantify what's in a lake. And I think it's actually been transformational in a lot of cases for building lake maps, understanding what's going on in the system from a scientific perspective. The forward-facing sonar is a little bit different. At this point, I don't see a direct application for forward-facing sonar with any sort of evaluation work that we do. Now, there has been work in the past with sonar has been used to assess forage availability in some systems. Interesting. Um, that was common on some of the reservoirs in the Savannah River chain in Georgia. Really? Where they would do the acoustic sampling of the forage base to take a look at how that was doing overall. But on our end, we don't do those type of surveys for forage. And I don't see forward facing sonar being directly useful at this point. That being said, our science teams come up with some really great ideas and if presented with a really good idea at our next science team meeting, I might change that that tune a little bit. Hmm. But right now, there's not a direct application from the scientific side of things. What's also really interesting to watch from the forward-facing perspective is concerns about over-harvest. Okay. I, I figured yep. you were going in that direction, yeah, Thomas. Go we, we've thought a lot about this, You know, following the message forum, seeing what the chatter is about it. There certainly is concern about how much more accessible this is making fish. But from our perspective, the proper response to something like that would be to modify size and bag limits if there's a problem. Yeah, because like I know with the crappie guys, that was a big thing where they're saying, I don't know if this is correct, but now you're able to target the bigger females now. You're understanding their behaviors, especially pre-spawn now. And with side, with, with, with forward-facing sonar getting so much so much better, you can you can almost look and be like, that's a two-pounder. You know, that's a pound and a half. Nintendo we can, fishing. You're Nintendo that's fishing. <laughs> and yeah, it's like what... The way it was described to me that that the limits are in place to where if every single person could limit out, there may or may not be an issue. But now if technology gets to the point that it's this insane and it's in like 5K on the front of your boat, is that something where it's like, okay, maybe at some point we do need to kind of factor in the technology, which is 
again, I remember when I had my first little Lorentz LMS five inch and I had GPS, that was badass. And now <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm getting like two 12 inch graphs on the front of my boat. So I can tell if, you know, if this one is 12 inches or if this one's going to be my kicker. And it's just, what is that? 10 years. It's insane. The jump. And then, so in another 10 years, it's almost something you have to start factoring in, in the future as tournaments. And there is more pressure from the, like you said, like the average angler that has the ability to acquire this information and then jump up their skill level by just purchasing better tech. I still think it's important to look at, this is not the first go around with new technology. I remember restrictions were called for, and this predates me with the old Lowrance green boxes when those first came out. There's been a, always been these moments of panic when new technology comes out there. From our perspective, we're not looking to restrict recreational opportunity. And quite honestly, if folks caught more fish, that's a good problem to have in most situations. Um, where it becomes not as good of a situation as if we did start to see declines um, in some of our fisheries um, independent sampling. If we were to see differences in age structure or size structure, um, we would then be likely to address it through size and bag limits. Again, trying to preserve recreational opportunity. From our perspective, we want to minimize restrictions that we put on folks and make sure there's a good reason for it. And what you're saying is there's really not going to be, it's not going to be a big crisis issue if everyone has forward facing. So I don't think it's going to be a big yeah. crisis issue. And again, um, with some of the harvest oriented fisheries, there's a bit more pressure on it, but most of our anglers have that strong conservation ethic. You know, in fact, 55% of our anglers don't keep any fish. You know, one of the biggest- Say that again? 55% wow. of our anglers are entirely catch and release. And there are actually a lot of our resources that hmm. would benefit that's, from some that's harvest. That's really cool. Um, you know? Yeah. How do you unwind that though? Because like I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about like bass specifically. I know like Frederick um, Hallerker's report drops, and I read it about bass being overpopulated. But when you spend, oh god, what was the first bass tournament catch and release was a thing? But like you, you spend twenty plus years, you know, a good message of not just you know catching and keeping, but you know you want to make sure you preserve the bigger females, put them back in, and then you hardwire that in there. I know if you ever put on Instagram that you're going to fillet a bass for dinner, oh my god, the comment section we, turn it off. We, it's, we, we, we actually did a, a piece on filleting largemouth bass. Yeah. For oh um, part well, you know, I think how it, did that go? Well, it, it, it actually went well. I, I admit I was biting my nails a little bit, but I, I think if you're, <laughs> it's important to remember that transparency is a big part about what we do. Oh, yeah. And if we're upfront about the reasons behind it, um, I think it really helps with it. Yeah. And I think we're starting to see folks keep more small largemouth bass. We certainly could use people keeping a lot more, mm -hmm. but we're starting to see more of that understanding because that's a, a real big role for bass anglers to play yeah. in the conservation of their resource. And there are far worse things to do than keep a bunch of small bass. And, that's, and that transparency is how we, how we basically approach that piece we were actually at amelia lake one of our wildlife management areas um and basically it's a bass crowded system it is overrun with fish 12 inches and smaller um and so the thought process that we described is if you can go out and harvest some of these smaller fish take them home have a nice meal free up the re uh basically resources for the remaining population to to take advantage of and hopefully you're improving the growth rate of the largemouth bass population over time um at a place like Amelia. And a lot of times we rely upon some level of harvest. Um, and if there's no level of harvest, then our bag and size limits aren't really doing much for us. Um, no, the bag and size limits are really the only two tools we have that are effective at managing a fish population. So as long as you have some level of harvest, but yeah. Well, yeah, that that's always the problem with those bass crowded systems in particular. Yeah. And it comes down to the culture, right? Because I know, like, for example, like a walleye fishery is going to is going to be a little bit different with the people that follow that because it is bigger on on harvesting versus, like you said, mm -hmm. a, a musky or a or largemouth. Mm -hmm. So is it basically your job to change, I guess, the cultural stigma of having bass for dinner? Well, you know, I think we're just trying to pro basically provide folks with information on the opportunity why we're advocating for harvest of smaller fish and then the fact that this is you know this is a great way to go out and catch a few fish and bring them back home and eat them and you know even for someone like myself that grew up with that whole catch and release ethic behind it i practice catch and release probably 90 percent mm -hmm. of the time but i do enjoy taking a fish home and 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 filleting it and eating it especially if i'm eating it a couple hours after it was swimming um so you know it's just a matter of providing the opportunity and letting people basically make their own decision but um trying to basically get 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 options out there 
for folks. It's weird though. Yeah. Like if if I was gonna take a walleye home, I probably wouldn't think twice about a crappie striper. Doesn't matter. But yeah, like as soon as I thought about cooking a largemouth, it was like it's that thing in your brain that just gets triggered. I don't know if it's because I like tournament fish or you're taught that. <laughs> and I don't even know if they do. They taste good. I'm mean, assuming they do, they're, right? They're they are better than you would think. I think okay. is the best way to describe it. I think they're comparable to eating bluegill or crappie. Hmm. Um, if you're doing a fish fry, I mean, yeah. Well, I've I've always the way I've prepped them is like I would bluegill or crappy, where I take the skin off, I cut the head off, I gut them, I dredge them in egg and flour, cornmeal, fry them, and then I put a bunch of hot sauce on them. That sounds really Cold good. Boom. I usually just fill up on fish. <laughs> you guys need to do a cooking segment on the YouTube channel. That would be awesome. We, we, yeah. we I would love to see you in the kitchen. Yeah, we had that. <laughs> we had that that video of uh, one of our biologists, Eric Brittle, filleting a small largemouth and just kind of going through the process and then um, guys it'll be linked above my head right here if you want to actually take a look at that uh that filleting video as well and of course link to everything that we talked about in the episode description as as we as we keep going here um no that's that's fine and again i have to bring up the the, the panoptics and stuff because it is wow that's tribal <laughs> If you go to any comment section on any fishing forum or whatever, you have the people that are for it and against it. And I, I do think that we need to bring the concerns, but that's why I want to talk about the positive stuff of using that technology to maybe instead of just doing electric shock, like this technology does have positives too. And just to kind of put a little bow on that about the, the, the problems as we go forward with technology, but you're right, like technology, it's just, it's always going to advance. And every time the new technology comes, people are like, this is what's going to end the world. Um, with the spotted bass, and the snakehead and, and all these other invasive species, what can people do? Because it's not like you can go out there and once they're in, you can get them out, correct? Generally, that's the case. Um, so if you've got an established population, um, you're not going to be able to remove them. But you know, if you catch one in a body of water where it's not supposed to be or not yet recorded, there's the possibility that that's only one of a couple. And at that point, it's extremely important to pull something like that out. So if you went to Lake Chesden and caught an Alabama bass, pull it out of there and call us. Yeah, and I was going to say too, Mike, if you want to touch upon our new rapid response protocol and how we've adopted that through the process. Oh, absolutely. What we'll do with that, if we get a report on something like that, we'll follow up. We have a specific process where we basically mobilize um, our resources to look at something as quickly as possible. You know, if we get a situation where we get a report of a snakehead, in a body of water where it's not occurred or not been reported, there is the chance that if we go out there and do it a detailed survey, that we may catch enough of them to keep them from getting established. It's more of a Hail Mary type of situation, but there's been enough football games won on a Hail Mary play to make it worth your while. Yeah, because like with, with all these species, like I, I think people get upset um, or are not, they're not aware that just because the invasive species in there, that doesn't mean that you're going to just firebomb the whole place and to get rid of it. Like that's not how any of this works. No, it, it's not feasible to yeah. go in there and poison or drain a water body. I know that folks get concerned about things like that and ideas like that getting floated or get floated around. Those ideas just aren't feasible. On a more positive note. <laughs> I, I did want to mention about the YouTube channel that you guys do a fishing report together, which is how, how did you guys start that? Because that is awesome to watch. Yeah. So um, that kind of really came about too during the uh, early stages of the pandemic, where basically we shut down all in person programming. Um, and we're like, okay, we can't run programs. We can't physically get folks out to, to workshops and actually teach people how to fish which is a lot, a lot of what I do. Um, but how do we reach people virtually? And luckily at our agency, we're set up with the infrastructure. We've got different channels. We have expertise. We have videographers, photographers, marketers, content managers. Um, we have the scientists that manage the fisheries. And how can we combine all, all of that expertise to kind of get the message out? And so we started trying to highlight different water bodies, um, different recreational opportunities, techniques and tactics for different species of fish during different times of the year, um, management goals, management objectives, um, and basically kind of started to try to get information out on a monthly basis. Um, and so that's kind of what really stemmed some of the fishing report videos that kind of took off over the last few years on, um, on our social media channels and that live on YouTube. Um, and we're really just trying to um, improve your the chances of success out on the water. Um, you guys got good chemistry us. though. Like yeah. I, I would love to see a fish competition video between you two on the boat. Oh, he, he <laughs> <laughs> it depends what we're fishing. Yeah, 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 oh, yeah. 
That's yeah. true. That's true. Trout, I'd probably give myself the upper like, hand. I think I bass fish too much. Yeah. yeah. What, we just I... have to get Mike fishing for something other than largemouth. Because your background's in trout, right? Is that what you really grew up targeting? So, yeah. So, well, growing up in, in Baltimore, just a little ways up the road, um, I basically was able to kind of cut my teeth on the gunpowder river tailwater. So below Pretty Boy Reservoir, there's seven and a half miles of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources manages that catch and release all wild trout um, fishery. It's actually very similar to uh, the Smith River, which is one of the resources we have um, a little further south of here. Uh, but um, kind of growing up, really focusing on the the trout stuff, but doing a, doing a good bit of striped bass, rockfish stuff on the Chesapeake Bay too. Um, but um, but yeah, just really being into the cold water side of things and doing a lot of fishing for wild trout, whether you're on tailwaters, spring creeks. I used to spend a lot of time up in South Central Pennsylvania, um, lived there for a year. There's outside so of, many trout streams oh, yeah, up there. <laughs> so much limestone, lots of trout opportunities. But um, but yeah, but um, basically having the opportunity to, to move to Richmond and any wild trout fishery is going to be about a two hour drive west of here. So really kind of expanding into more than warm water opportunities. And I've been having so much fun with smallmouth, largemouth, chain pickerel, bowfin, um, walleye, saw guy, some of these other species that if you're just focused on trout, you kind of miss out on. And that's what makes Virginia so unique is there's oh, yeah. so much diversity. I yeah. mean, yeah, and that's, and we talked about that where, and I think it's also, it's helpful. It's like, because of DC and the, and the reason I named the channel, like um, the DMV is, when I would go down to Colorado's National Championships, Alabama, and, you know, I'd talk about like when they fish their circuit and like all the lakes are within two minutes of their house. Yeah. And, and so they don't drive anywhere. They don't think they, they should commute. And I tell them like, well, what was your tournament series? It's like, well, we went to the James, the Potomac, to Smith. And like, dude, that's a lot of driving. He's like, that's normal for us. And, and I think that's a positive, not a negative that if you tell somebody that you should go to like Moomaw, they're going to go because they're used to because of usually the jobs and everything of commuting. Yeah. And so even though Virginia is a massive state, I don't think it bothers as many people because you're so used to having to commute so much to, yeah, bet, let's go if it's worth it. Yeah, and It's such a positive. Um, and I was spying on your Instagram. Did you just go striper fishing recently? So we, yeah, we, we. Um, <laughs> oh, we have to hear about this fish again. <laughs> I, I, I need, I need to hear about it for the first time. <laughs> so um, we actually uh, did a piece with, um, uh, WFXR, which is a local Fox affiliate station down in uh, Roanoke. There's an outdoor reporter there, a friend of mine, George Noliff, um, who was doing a, a piece on um, on fishing for winter rockfish um, in the lower Chesapeake Bay. And so we were basically down there pulling live eels under planer boards um, and uh, basically trying to target big fish. When, if you run into them, they're, they're typically big this time of the year, but it's one of those high risk high reward kind of deals where you could go out and spend a whole day and get blanked, or you could hook up with the biggest fish of the year, or the biggest fish you've caught in the last five years. So it's kind of a high risk, high reward kind of deal. Uh, but that's what's so cool about Virginia again is two hours in one direction, you could be on a native brook trout stream and then two hours the other direction, you could be pulling eels for giant striped bass. So, so uh, what's so, this, what's the story? What's this so, fish story? So basically just got, just got lucky. Had a, had a rod go off next to me and got to, got to play tug of war with a, with a big rock fish over 50 pounds, which oh is pretty cool. God, that so, is so freaking awesome. Yeah. Pretty wild. How much over 50 was it? It was 56 pounds, Mike. <laughs> Almost yeah. 60. Yeah. <laughs> it was big. It was big. We're not going to round it up. It was right at 56, but, uh, but yeah, good fish though. Yeah, you're right though. Fish. If you're just in the bass world and all you do is fish tournaments, you forget like what is the what is the state record striper? Is it is it? So eight, it eight depends eight? on if you're talking salt water or fresh water. Ooh, okay. So our state records would be only on inland landlocked systems like Bugs Island or any of our reservoirs. Um, the tidal migratory striped bass that do spend some time in the freshwater portions of our tidal rivers would be basically that saltwater population which would fall under vmrc's state record um our sister agency the virginia marine resource commission i think the state record striper is maybe 70 is it 78 pounds in, Vir in virginia it's not for, 78 was that new jersey fish that used or is to it be 74 the world pounds is the state record let me look it up real quick hold up that's also interesting with the chesapeake then Records caught out of there, they don't count towards the Virginia state record. Is that correct? So for something like a striped bass, that would not. But something like a blue catfish, largemouth bass, black crappie, something like that absolutely would as a freshwater species. 
striped bass are a little bit different with that sea run versus the landlock. Um, okay. Sorry. I was, I was, I was a few pounds off this, this Virginia state record striped bass is 74 pounds. Okay. Um, Smith mountain Lake. No, this is the, uh, this was actually, um, caught on January 20th by Kerry Wolf of Bristow, Virginia. Um, so that was a, that would, would have been a VMRC's record. Um, either in the lower bay or it was off the coast of Virginia. I'm not sure which one. And yeah, that's important to to let people know about like where the jurisdiction ends with the Chesapeake. That yeah. Yeah, it kind of just depends on um like I was saying, is is it a freshwater fish or is it one of those anadromous migratory fish? From a license perspective, there's demarcation lines that are published within the regulation guide. So yeah. where you need a freshwater or saltwater license. So our current Inland freshwater striped bass state record is a 53 pound seven ounce fish from Leesville Reservoir, caught on March 16th, 2000. It's a it's a large fish, <laughs> but anyway, um, so yeah, yeah, pretty cool. That's but. that's interesting. Could could you hit on that again? Because I think if you aren't in the know and you go to the website and you click and you get a saltwater license, it's clearly you guys. You're the responsible for the Chesapeake Bay because I went to the website and I clicked and I didn't read anything because my kids are yelling at me in the background and I'm just trying to get the fishing license real quick. Um, but yeah, could you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, the, the demarcation lines for where you need a freshwater or saltwater license are listed in the regulation guide. Um, it's important to check into those before you purchase a license. Although I would contend, I think you're better off to get a saltwater and a freshwater fishing license because with the opportunities we were talking about, you can do it I all. couldn't imagine not doing one or the other. I think it's important to do both. So that's my shameless plug <laughs> to get out there and do both. <laughs> but from, from a practical perspective, those demarcation lines are published with where you need the saltwater or the freshwater license. And they're river specific. Yeah, because like I think that that is unique that when you say Virginia and the state records and stuff, it, I think a lot of people don't understand. Like, there's also another governing body that actually will operate a, a big majority of the Chesapeake. So, if you're upset about like the pilchard issue or something like that, it's like don't yell at you guys or or how or who you need to talk to about that if you see an issue. I mean, Thomas, to be honest, I have gotten phone calls yelling at me about things completely outside of our jurisdiction. Um, had one this morning actually. Um, but in all, in all seriousness, we work hand in hand with the VMRC. I think we've got our, our quarterly meeting with them next week where myself and my assistant fish chief will go meet with um, their chief of uh, fish side of things, as well as his assistant fish chief to talk about joint issues. But we stay in close contact. And if I've got a constituent calling that needs to talk to Marine Resources Commission, I'll do everything I can to make sure that they get a call back. Um, I don't want to send them into a phone tree to try to get through. I'll find the right person and make sure they call them back because I think it's important for us to work together on these issues. And you know what? A concerned angler is a concerned angler. And I'll do everything I can to help get them the answers they they really want to get. Because so if, if a spot, if an Alabama bass was found in a, a tidal fishery connected to the Chesapeake Bay, then that would still follow on fall under your jurisdiction, yeah, into, correct? Into tidal, into tidal fresh. Into tidal fresh. Okay. Because we had gotten a report on Diasin Creek actually, and this this came entirely through us. And from a Marine Resource Commission perspective, something like Alabama bass is more of an FYI than anything else, um, just because that would fall in as a freshwater fish and then entitled freshwater would fall to us. Mm -hmm. That being said, they're also familiar enough with the issue where we would get a report from them as well and would work together to follow up on it. Mm, okay. Resources was, was the other thing that we, we mentioned uh, before we hit hit record. When something like this comes up and, and with anything, you always have a finite amount of resources, how that's got to be just a pain to just think about with everything you guys have to, to deal with, whether it is, you know, the, the James River and the Smith Mountain Lake, you know, F1 stocking, or now you have this Alabama bass issue and before it was a snakehead issue. Like how, how do you guys figure out how to allocate your resources properly? So what I try to do as, as the head of the fisheries program is to be as efficient as possible and try to plan ahead and be proactive. So we have a strategic plan in place for the, the fisheries division over here. We've got several fishery management plans that spell out where the priorities lie, where they go. Um, and we do that to make sure that we can respond appropriately with the resources we have. Because it's not a good enough answer to say, well, we're too busy to deal with something like this. Because if we get into a rapid response situation, we have to drop what we're doing and we also have to cover everything else. 
but we try to be as proactive as possible. We try to plan ahead. We, we recognize the fact that even though we're not supported by general tax dollars, um, people do pay a fee into the Department of Wildlife Resources, get a fishing license. And we're very conscious about being efficient with those resources and getting the most bang for the buck that we can. So we try to plan ahead. We try to be prepared for what we can. And quite honestly, we've got some really hardworking folks. And a lot of us mm -hmm. put in some very long weeks to get the job done if we need to. I mean, you guys have done an absolute hell of a job. And, and again, this I think we mentioned this earlier, but like the bass population right now in Virginia, is it's insane how many teeners are being pulled out now. And I, I know the res had a bunch that were like borderline 10. Uh, Lake Frederick yesterday, a friend of mine just pulled out a 9.7 out of Lake Frederick. You got the James. I mean, where, and I got to get this on camera. Do you think in the next like 10, 20, 30 years, do you think something close to that 12 to 16 pound range? We'll come out of Virginia. You don't have to say where. And we're talking 12, absolutely. Okay. 16 bring it down. A, six, it's, it's six, 16 is a much harder bridge to cross. In your lifetime. You don't think I, it's I think, I think 16 is a very high threshold to be, given the growing season that we have here in Virginia. I certainly think that, you know, getting those 12s and 13s, I think a 14 is completely reasonable in the next 10 years. Really? But I think 16, everything has to come together so perfectly to beat 16 that I think that, that that's a much taller order. I'm going to hold you to that dollar. I, I will I, happily yeah. pay you that dollar. <laughs> uh, if I'm wrong, I would love nothing more than to get a phone call about a 17 pound largemouth tomorrow. I, I mean, like, I didn't think a dirty 30 would ever get caught at Lake Anna like this quickly. And then that already dropped. Uh, I think it was four weeks ago at a Sturgeon Creek, a dirty, a dirty 30 a guys, dirty 30 just means like five fish close to, or over 30 pounds. Um, I, I mean, and, those, and that's, Smith mountains taken mid twenties, Chickahominy has been mid twenties into the low thirties. Um, if you're fishing a spring tournament at Cheson and everything is right, you're going to need 28. Cheson is another dark horse. Like where did that come from? I remember fishing a tournament, a youth tournament there. And if you caught like 12, that was a big deal. I'm dating myself now, but, um, but now it's like on the map, like what happened with that place? It's always been pretty good. I, I think what happens with Cheson is folks are getting more aware of it. Because there's always a lot of pressure there coming in the springtime. You'll see a lot of out-of-state plates going there starting in my... I guess the disclaimer is I live 20 minutes from Lake Chesna. <laughs> Home water. So Home I spend a lot of time out there. But you'll see folks travel up from North Carolina to fish there. It's got a tremendous forage base. So the big fish are in there. And I think what we're starting to see is folks are getting better at figuring out how to catch some of those fish that may not be up on the banks. You know, if you go to like at the risk of burning a, a technique, if you go to Chesden in March with a suspending jerk bait, I was telling Alex I lost a fish more than eight pounds boat side. The year before I lost a fish. I still hear about it. I lost a fish <laughs> the year before on a big swim bait, <laughs> just uh just around eight pounds up up at the top part of Chesden. Yeah, it I've can, I've it, we had a trip out there where we had a fish that was almost seven and another fish six dropped boat side. Fishing 38 degree muddy water. Wow. Yeah, that was crazy. Um, that Chesden consistently ranks um, as the, the number one fishery in what we call region one, which is basically Richmond east to Richmond metro area, east through the coastal plains to Virginia beach for an impoundment. It ranks number one for that preferred size largemouth bass which is i think like 16 17 inches and larger for the for sheer numbers of um or that abundance of those larger size fish so um it just just has good size structure there and a, a lot of forage obviously which can make fishing 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 frustrating yeah if you you ride around and you look at your sonar there you're just like yeah you will, you will have days on chesden that will absolutely make it look like the best body of water you've ever fished and you'll have days on Chesden where you think you should sell all your gear and take up golf. Does it still have a bunch of standing timber? Uh, there's not um, a lot of timber in Chesden right now. There's a lot of stumps. Yeah, stumps. Yeah. There's a ton of stumps up in the top part okay. of the lake. So it can be a bit hazardous to navigate. But the main thing at Chesden is pretty much your water willow. Um, the whole lake is rimmed with water willow. And there's a lot of points, a lot of rock structure in that lake to kind of pick through. There's also some vegetation, but I, I'm not inclined to give out the details of some of the specific. You know, GPS waypoints or anything? <laughs> you find vegetation in Ches and there's fish on it. We'll just leave it at that. Do you? How much do you get out in fish now? Okay, that's got to be weird going from like, I want to be the next Kevin Van Dam to now you're this. And then like, like how does that? <laughs> I, I realistically get out about three times a month. 
And a lot of it's dependent on season. I like to fish in the winter. Um, I actually, you know, spend a lot of my summers actually going thing, doing things like hiking and traveling around the state because there's a lot of really great stuff to see in Virginia and the lakes are very crowded. But come February, if it's, um, I always joke that rain, cold, or wind pick one. If it's just one of those, I'm usually out there during the weekend at Cheson. And sometimes I'll take some time off during the week and go out to Cheson in the winter. Yeah, I feel like you shine in water that's in air temps less than 35 water around. 40. Well, you know, you got, you got to you got to be prepared for it, too. I actually wear a float jacket yeah. when I'm oh, out yeah. there by myself in the winter. So when you do the fishing report, you just send him out there to figure out the pattern. And then the next day you film or like how does there's been a uh, well, Mike's Mike's on the reserve. Mike's on Chesden enough that he kind of has a pretty good lay of the land and what's going on and a lot of times if we're trying to put content together we'll go run six or seven spots to you know put some stuff together but um but yeah um yeah you know when it when it comes to bass you know mics are sort of our internal our internal guru in that in that regard I, I think it's also important to recognize too that a lot of our staff are anglers yeah you know if you've talked about jason halliker guy likes the musky fish mm -hmm. um we we mentioned eric brittle doing some of the uh, bass fillet videos because eric likes the bass fish um we've had steve owens do some trout work directly yeah. so what we really try to do is get that perspective with the fishing reports you know there's a lot of jokes about all the bass fishing et cetera, et cetera, because that's what I like to do. But Alex works closely with a variety of different staff to get different species targeted. And it's something that we all take seriously as resource managers. And if we can help folks catch a bit more fish based off of some of the skills we have, even if it involves giving up some secret lures or potentially burning a spot, we're willing to do it to help people catch some extra fish. How strong is the tribalism? Like you, like I, I'm a bass guy. I know like my side can get a little rowdy, but then like you, you get to look and try to bring on each section um, in your fishing reports and in your content. And you've seen this being a trout guy. And I know trout guys can be very uh, passionate about what they do. And you, you must really see that, especially in this office with everyone. Yeah, but we well, we all we all like to to fish for a variety. I mean, different species, variety, of different species. I, I am no. I like to fly fish. If I can get a fish on the fly rod, that's the way I'm going to do it. I'm no purist by any means. I'll fish with a spinning rod. I'll fish with a conventional setup. I'll fish with bait. Um, but uh, it's you know everyone kind of has their own little own little niche. I guess Mike's really focused on the bass kind of stuff. But you know we all we all you know we all enjoy a variety of different species. I think one, Mike would probably tell you one of his favorite fish is channel catfish. Oh, channel catfish are fun to catch. Yeah. I do enjoy catching channel catfish. Yeah. Um, and channel catfish actually underpin a lot of the work that we do in some of the more developed areas to get people out there to fish through our fish local Virginia program. Yeah. yeah. But we have, you know, I mean, obviously you have, um, you know, we do, we do different videos and you have people that have different opinions on different fisheries or different techniques and that kind of stuff. But we try to, basically just present out opportunities so that regardless of how you want to approach fishing, um, you can have success with a variety of different tactics. And that's what we oftentimes try to do. If we're targeting a certain species of fish during a certain time of the year, we'll try to break down tactics for an artificial approach, tactics for a fly rod approach. Hey, if you like fishing with live bait, you can go this route. We've got a video coming out in the next week or two on saw guy. There's good setup for the next segment. There we go. And we actually talk about approaching them with live bait which is a very effective way to catch saw guy approach them with artificial lures and even approach them with a fly rod which is more challenging um yeah since you set it up go into like wh but why yeah. the saw guy yeah so good. saw guy are, are um actually a, a really cool fish that we've been managing now for about a decade i think it started around 2013 um and Really, what what saw guy are is they're a, um, a hybrid between a walleye, female walleye, and a male sauger. Um, and a lot of uh, water bodies that that we manage, particularly in the northern and and eastern part of the state, that we manage for walleye. Walleye aren't necessarily native to those resources, but we've managed them as a as a game fish in those resources for decades. And some of those resources, despite tinkering with the stocking rates um, and trying to basically create walleye fisheries the habitat might not necessarily be ideal for a walleye and we we basically some of these impoundments that we've managed we've had sort of marginal success with walleye um but when we manage these same fisheries with saw guy we've had off the chart um 
success uh, from growth rates, survival rates. They tend to do a little bit better in slightly more turbid systems, um, maybe with slightly tolerating slightly more uh, warmer water temperature regimes and that kind of stuff. So the uh, really the sawguy fisheries that we're managing um, are fisheries that had historically been managed as wildlife fisheries. And there's only about a half dozen water bodies in the northern and, and eastern part of the state. Lake Chesson is one of them. Um, and we're just seeing really good, really good growth rates on these fish. So, so over those 10 years, you then had to build out the logistical system. It wasn't just, we're going to start stalking the, this, and this is something we're going to do. And then it happens. You have right. to go from that to then what creating just the fish hatchery program, developing enough to then like, that was what was happening through that whole 10 year plan to get it up to speed. So actually it's a really good example of a partnership between our agency and our counterparts over in West Virginia. Um, and, uh, West Virginia DNR, they have, um, the Ohio river serves as, um, it's a great soccer fishery and it basically serves as, uh, basically that, that source of the sauger for us for creating a saw guy. Some of our biologists will go over to West Virginia, help out with the sampling. Um, actually it's usually around this time of the year, it'll, it'll be coming up in a few weeks as we get closer to the spawn. Um, and we'll help out and actually go out and collect um uh, reproductively mature sauger and then we'll actually um extract the milt um from the sauger and travel that back uh to some of our hatchery systems here where we can then collect our female walleye uh, extract the eggs and then basically create sauge the hybrid species there in a very controlled setting uh, and then raise those fish to fingerling size and then stock them into certain water bodies across the state and what we're seeing with the survival rate is is really really encouraging and then the growth rate in those certain systems um john odenkirk talks about what he's seeing on lake anna in the video but seeing one-year-old fish that are already 12 13 inches long which is pretty wild um and fish that are two years old that are 16 17 inches long so you know getting getting to that um uh hitting that size limit quickly. Um, how many fish, I know about the front Royal getting up and running. Um, how many fish hatcheries are in Virginia when you're talking about the trout stocking, the catfish now, the sauger, like, is it just one massive, just Zootopia thing in central Virginia or like what? So we have a total of nine, right? Yes. Five cold water and four warm water. Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, all across the state. Um, and considering this is under Mike's purview, I'll let him talk a little bit more about our systems, but we, we do everything from cold water trout to more temperate species like walleye and striped bass. Yeah, we have five cold water facilities where we grow brook, brown, rainbow, and tiger trout. Um, and we've got four warm water fish, war, four warm water facilities where we grow walleye, um, musky, striped bass, and sawgye. Um, we actually augment this with um, fish purchases on things like F1 largemouth bass, Hybrid, Chan striper. hybrid striped bass, channel catfish, because those are species that are just are not time effective to grow here in Virginia in our hatcheries. Um, the southeast, the more southeastern regions have a better climate for growing things like um, largemouth bass or channel catfish. But we can grow plenty of trout, plenty of walleye, and plenty of striped bass. And if it wasn't for the hatchery production of striped bass, we would not have inland striped bass fisheries in Virginia. We would not have a lot of walleye fisheries. You'd still see places like the the New River or the Stanton River support a fishery, but the small impoundment walleye fisheries that we have and sawgye fisheries would not exist without the presence of those four warm water hatcheries. So the F ones you purchase now, do you have just a a northern strain largemouth that that you guys raise as, to do little bodies of water or what with that? So throughout the state, most of our largemouth bass are actually um, about fifty fifty lar northern largemouth and Florida largemouth just by the nature of stocking over the years, basically across the state, that's the distribution we have. You're not gonna find pure strain Northern or pure strain Florida largemouth anywhere in Virginia. It just doesn't exist. Hmm. Um, the F1 largemouth bass have been an experiment to see if we can augment the largemouth bass populations in our larger reservoirs by these low level stockings. And what we found Pre uh, preliminarily has been very encouraging. We've starting to see fish in places like Smith Mountain Lake show up from these stockings. Um, we're able to test them and figure out which ones are actually the first generation hybrids. 
And, you know, a lot of the credit tends to go to the genetics. What we found is that because they're stocked at a slightly larger size than they would be naturally at that point, they get a bit of a jump on growth. Interesting. So that jump on growth seems to carry through the rest of their lives. So it's basically the equivalent of if they were spawned a little bit earlier and we had a real warm spring. What size are they usually stocked at? About that big. Scientific. Uh, About you guys that can big. For the camera. Small ones. <laughs> Yeah, that's, dwindling size. And so then that's that dropping back into the, the saga. So then if you're going to drop round number 100,000 into Lake Anna, logistically, is that a, you have to go back two to three years when you decide to implement that plan of getting things set up for that? Or is that just the year before you know that we're just going to raise 100,000 and dump it in there? Like how many years does it take to, to do that? It's It's really a year before. Oh, year, wow. So it's, it's um, our systems are very adaptable. We have some excellent hatchery managers. And the production, so right now we're getting walleye brood stock. We're preparing for this. So okay. the thing would be is they got a request last year for how many walleye they need and how many sauge they need. So what will happen is they'll get the walleye brood stock and then we'll probably send Scott over to get sauger milk for the sauge production of it. But they're geared for this. They're well prepared. And they also keep a couple of ponds on like an experimental basis to grow things like red ear sunfish, bluegill, or even crappy in some cases are <laughs> stocked. Um, so we've got a lot of resiliency in the system that way because we've got the variety that's there. But on something like striped bass, we'll actually know a year or two out based off of forage availability, um, i.e. how much food is in there, as well as the numbers that we're seeing. Because on something like striped bass, we have to tune the numbers very carefully to make sure we don't overexploit the forage base and end up with a lot of small striped bass. But we also want to make sure there's enough striped bass in there where folks catch them. Um, and it's, it's all informed on a fairly regular basis and they're fairly adaptable to about a year out. And with the striped bass, it's pretty neat. Any inland landlocked water body in the Chesapeake Bay watershed will be Chesapeake Bay strain striped bass. Whereas if you're looking at Smith mountain Lake, that's Roanoke drainage, right? So we, we spend a lot of time and effort ensuring the genetic integrity of these various water bodies that we're managing, um, on an inland basis. Um, and, and to elaborate on Alex's you know. point, I'm glad you brought that up because we try really hard to adhere to some very high fish health standards. Um, the health fish health standards that we have in our hatcheries are above and beyond what you'd expect out of the private sector um, because we want to make sure that we don't unintentionally spread pathogens through the, out the state. Um, we do what we can to treat them when they come up, up to and including euthanizing fish um, to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just part of the way we try to do business there. Um, and with the genetic integrity thing, you know, we're also creative with things like triploid rainbow trout. Yeah. So we like to stock triploid rainbow trout where there's the potential that we'd see some interference with native brook trout. Because if you stock triploid rainbow trout, they are, they're sterile, so they can't establish a population in those water bodies. They also have the bonus if they get bigger. So just a and in further on the genetic side of things, we actually do a lot of work. I apologize for being a bit scattered on it because this is one of the coolest things. Yeah, no, do. no, and go for it. Like seven this, this, or eight a lot of these conversations, yeah. And um, one of the other really cool ones is with the New River Walleye. Yeah. So we, we actively select for New River Walleye at our hatcheries for the New River drainage. And it's this really great example of restoring a native population of fish that also just happens to get a little bit bigger yeah. than the walleye we'd see. It's a it's a win on so many different levels. For people that don't know, that are listening, Virginia is so cool because of the New River walleye. Could you touch on that? What makes them so special? The, the New River walleye population is genetically distinct from a lot of other walleye populations. Um, it's well adapted to that system, and it also happens to grow just a bit larger than what mm. we see with walleye in other areas. That's yeah, a little so bit cool. longer growing season down here. And I think the fish benefit a little bit. And there are there are folks that think the next world record might come out of oh, uh, yeah. I, might, I think might that, come yeah. out of that. I I'm not saying it will or won't, but there is definitely that's definitely I've heard that debated on a, on some different different I, I am trying to get a new river keeper on here because I think the river is freaking fascinating. Is it the second oldest river in the world? Third oldest? Yeah, it's, it's, ancient, it's ancient. It's ancient. You need to talk to Sergeant West Billings. He's one of our sergeants in our uh, law division down there avid avid walleye angler um we did a, a piece with him on clitter lake last summer doing the night crawler harness slow trolling kind of deal um maddeningly frustrating way to fish if you've never done it before you're just constantly snagged but once you get the feel right 
and you're ticking bottom and you're moving that harness rig up and over structure, it could be a deadly tactic. But he lives and breathes walleye, um, fishes for them year round, and uh, he catches some of his biggest fish on the New River in the months of December and January, um, pre-spawn. Um, and he, he does a lot of like, li you know, live line and um, form and that kind of stuff but uh yeah they catch big fish the, new river, the, year in the, winter. the state is so big i mean we're here in richmond and like the new river feels like it is like forever away yeah that's because and it is forever yeah. away <laughs> that place is so wild too i've been there yeah. one time and it's just like a different planet like, and then try getting here. down to the clinch or the the holston drainage down to far southwest virginia you spend four and a half hours on i-81 and you're still in virginia so there's some pretty cool diversity we have. That's insane. I, I mean, and, and getting back to to um, putting a bow on the fisheries, the fish hatcheries, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the smallmouth. And it is, it's probably easier to put a man on the moon, and this is what I've heard, to put a man on the moon than to breed a smallmouth in ca captivity. I think what, it's a little easier than that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but like, so, so I, I want to pick your brain about that. Like, why set the stage of, is it hard to do it? And why is it hard to do it? It's complex to do that. It, it's a bit challenging, whether it's getting broodstock at the right time, managing the pond temperatures at the right time, dealing with kind of encouraging them to spawn and build nests and how you set that up with raceways versus ponds. Smallmouth are not as adaptable as a largemouth when it comes to spawning conditions. Largemouth will ultimately, in a pond, spawn. They'll find a place to spawn. They'll, they'll ultimately will. Yeah. Smallmouth aren't like that. Which makes it a lot more challenging. Yeah, a little more we're, finicky in well, the aquaculture setting. We're, we're optimistic at Front Royal with the new new equipment coming online that we'll be able to crack it a bit better. And we're hoping that we'll be able to stock those fish into um, some of the river systems and get a positive benefit. I am reasonably confident that we'll be able to get some good production out of there. I'm actually very confident. We've got some great folks working out there. And if we don't succeed, we'll keep trying. We'll work with folks from across the country. Um, cause there are folks that are effective at growing smallmouth bass and hatcheries. We just haven't had the kind of infrastructure I think we really need in the past. And that, which species I, I'm assuming like, which species is harder from a financial standpoint to, to actually grow in the numbers needed f to stock and which ones are, you know, easier? Well, that, again, it gets back to what we grow and what we stock. So we stock catchable trout, um, because it's cost effective to grow trout to catchable size here in Virginia. We stock fingerling um, walleye and striped bass because it's cost effective to grow them out to that size. We know that at that size introduced, they'll actually get into a fishery, establish populations, and they'll do well. Um, it's more cost effective for us to do things like buy channel catfish or F1 largemouth bass, given mm -hmm. the climate that we have. Um, we just don't have the growing season for those type of species. And with something like channel catfish in particular, we buy at a catchable size um, so that our anglers can catch them after they're stocked in there rather than wait for them to grow. So it's it's kind of an optimization problem, if you will, about climate, cost, angler preferences, um, what the lakes can support, what the rivers can support. And we've just about optimized it on all of those different species to be cost effective and maximize recreational opportunity. And we and we work across state state lines all the time with our counterparts in West Virginia, North Carolina. Just you know, we're, we just put out a piece on a on some of our musky collaboration yeah. with North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission. North Carolina has been vital with us having stockable musky, and the only reason we have northern pike in Virginia is because New Jersey. Um, comes up with northern pike quite a bit, it has some surplus, and we stock northern pike. Yeah, it's just like I don't think anyone I, I've looked online ever asked that question from the logistical side point of, of stocking. Like, you know, is the smallmouth going to take more resources to get up and going because it's just a little bit more finicky compared to just trout, compared to catfish? It's and then when you look at when you got this massive state and you do have maybe this lump sum, it's like okay, we can with this we can do the trout very easily, but then it'll take that same amount of resources to do like the F one. And then like how you guys try to figure out a game plan for that. And I think that's just really fascinating because of the logistics that you guys have to do. And because when people look on a map, example, trout, the trout are stocked twice here. Congratulations. But do you understand the logistics of that that have to take place to like, I mean, I don't know, half a million trout, like whatever, give or take, something like that. We like, stock about a million catchables. A, a million. So that you have to raise that. 
Then -hmm. you need the vehicles. Then you need to know where you're going to go and the people. And like, I don't think people appreciate the logistical side. All they see is the guy with the net that chuck them in and leave. There's some great, great content. Speaking of Jason Halliker, some great content that you can link as well um, on what goes into stocking trout in Virginia. Um, and basically the, the effort that our hatchery staff are dedicated to, um, and then what goes into basically getting those fish in, cause it's more than just pulling up to the mm-hmm. edge of a parking lot and putting them in. I mean, we're oftentimes using old logging roads where oh, we're, God. yeah, we're, we've got basically, you know, um, F two fifties and we're, we're getting back with four wheel drive, trying to get these fish, uh, as, as dispersed throughout certain river systems as we as we can yeah i didn't even think about like you know it was a native great brook trout. trout yeah like oh. there's a great trout stocking video that that jason yeah. put together you'll have to link and then guys yeah that'll be linked in the episode description as well yeah. um and we covered a lot like what what did we miss all good stuff um uh, yeah so. I mean, again th- thanks again and then I, do you guys got any like non-work related fishing goals this year i'm gonna try to crack 10 for a large mouth okay Okay. I think this is the year where I just target trophy fish. I say that every year <laughs> and every, every year, usually around uh, mid January, I start to get distracted and pick up the spinning rod. But I think this year I'm going to try to crack 10. Just throw glide baits the whole year. I, I got a big top water bait. I like to throw that. I'd like to not name specifically. I think I'm going to throw a bit more of that this year. You still fish tournaments though, right? I do not. Really? I do not. I have not tournament fished since I left the state of Massachusetts. Has, I don't know. Wow. How does it make you feel? I don't know if I could do that. Like to, you- to be honest with you, I feel very privileged to do what I do. And to me, not fishing tournaments is not a big deal because I get to show up to work every day and work with a program that really helps to make um, good recreational opportunities exist. And I have no regrets about giving up tournament fishing to do that. Um, I love coming to work every day. I'm excited. I lose sleep over the problems we have. So never a Wednesday night or ever again, nothing like that. Not as long as I'm working for the department. I I just don't want to be in a situation like that um, where I just, for me, it's, it's, it's not appropriate for somebody at an administrator level and a fishery. I didn't even think about So, okay. Gotcha. 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 Okay. So I'm I'm very very cautious about um, making sure that we stay as above board and appropriate. We're all excited about fisheries, but it's also important to maintain a level of transparency and objectivity to manage them properly. I didn't even think about that. Okay. So if you did, it have to be after retiring kind of deal. I'm planning to retire in a certain date so I can tournament fish in the future, but that's <laughs> that makes sense. Still, okay. no, still, gotcha, men, gotcha, still gotcha. many years off. No, I didn't even think about that. So yeah. Wow. On to goals. Uh, Come on. Know, one goal of mine is to catch a muskie. Never done it before. On a fly? I would love to get one on fly, but I think it'd probably be easier to catch one with conventional equipment first just to kind of get the first one out of the way and then maybe go for one on the fly but did you catch a recent uh, monster brown trout recently um i thought we were talking about that earlier uh you know i i um i don't you know i actually to be honest with you i didn't do a whole lot of trout fishing last year which is kind of embarrassing i was so focused on a lot of other stuff but um it's been i i need to i need to get back on some of the tailwaters this this spring. What's your personal best brown trout? Yeah. Are you going to try to beat that this year? I would love to, but it might be it might be it might be a challenge. I got how big was that fish out west? That was just shy of thirty inches, wow. but um, right around twenty eight. But uh, but yeah, upper North Platte River outside of um, uh, Saratoga, Wyoming. Um, so, but that that's been about four or five years now. I think you said that guide said that was the largest brown trout he'd ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's your biggest trout in Virginia? In Virginia, um, I've caught some browns on the Jackson tailwater that were right around 22 inches. Um, lengthwise, didn't weigh them, but um, but they grow bigger than that. <laughs> there's there's two foot two foot plus wild browns in the Jackson, and then another uh, wild trout fishery that has some really really big fish would be the South Fork of the Holston River. The stretch near our Buller Fish Hatchery has some absolute giants. Um, that's another, those are probably the two top places I would recommend going for trophy wild stream bread brown trout. Okay. Um, completely off topic. Have yeah. you ever wanted to saltwater fish with a fly? And if so, what would you want to catch? Oh, I, I saltwater fish with a fly. That's how I prefer to fish in saltwater is with a fly rod. Really? Yeah, I do. I've done it a lot. Um, one of the most fun fish on a fly rod in saltwater would be false albacore. They're fantastic. They take in your backing within a, within seconds um i got the the chance to to do that actually off the coast of um 
Massachusetts. Um, it's been about six or seven years, but that was one of the coolest experiences I've had in saltwater. That's with so fly. freaking cool. But you can do a lot, even just from the bank down in um, uh, the eastern portion of the state on where some of our tidal rivers enter the bay, uh, puppy drum, speckled trout, striped bass, all these species you can target in the right setting with a fly. So. We're going to do a, se a separate segment on that because I don't even know like how you'd even start to get the right tackle for that to yeah. tackle. You, you scale up. It's a lot of eight and nine weight fly rods, uh, depending on the, the type of water you're fishing. It's a lot of full sinking line, um, 350 to 450 grain full sinking line. But a lot of our opportunities, you can fish in relatively shallow water on the Chesapeake Bay um, where you can do a lot of sight fishing, especially for puppy drum in the Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads area, which can be a ton of fun on a fly rod so um and, or light tackle for that matter but that's yeah, yeah that, that that'll be another pandora's box for another day lots I, of good salt water opportunities I, yeah <laughs> michael alex thank you again for having me down here this has been absolutely wonderful to be able to pick your brain um about everything that's going on especially whether it's our hatcheries uh the alabama bass situation um is there a phone number uh i don't think we mentioned it but We'll mention again, if, if someone does catch something that they think is a Alabama bass, is there a phone number they can call or, or what should they do? Uh, they should email us at fisheries at dwr.virginia.gov with their contact information and we'll follow up. Okay. Awesome. You, can always, you can always call our headquarters. It's 804-367-1000. And I'll get you in contact with customer service and you can ask to speak from, to fisheries from there. But either either technique will get you to us. Awesome. Good deal. And then guys, link in the episode description to everything that we just talked about today. Uh, if you have any more questions, again, please reach out to me. I'll try to get them answered or please reach out to these individuals here and hopefully they can get you what you need. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.